Rahim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Say, O oh my servants who have transgressed against their own souls, Asrafu ala anfusihim, who have utterly corrupted themselves. La taqnatu mi rahmatillah. Never ever despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is impermissible. It is haram, just as haram as drinking wine, eating pork, and fornication. It is haram to despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to be in a state of qunut of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. La taqnatu. This la in Arabic is called la and nahiya, the prohibitive la. You are not allowed to despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah forgives all sins. He is the forgiving and He is the merciful. What we have in our Muslim communities is a crisis of ilm, a crisis of knowledge. And a crisis of knowledge is always correlated with a crisis of love, a crisis of mahabba. Because you can judge a person's love for something by how much knowledge that person has of that particular thing. This was particularly true of the pre-modern world, right? Nowadays, unfortunately, a lot of people, because there's a fear of poverty, they feel like they have to study things and they have to work at certain jobs because that's what's going to put food on the table. But no one, not a lot of people can actually follow what they love to study. So you have people who are getting degrees in technical fields, sitting in cubicles for 10 hours a day, and it's paying the bills, but there's great depression that's happening on the inside because they've been indoctrinated into thinking that unless they're, you know, in some sort of corporate position that they're not going to be able to support their families. And children, you know, they're the best example of this. You know, children, when they talk about something, when they have a lot of knowledge about something, it's an indication that they love that thing. If they're talking about sports or comic books or something like that, and they have a lot of knowledge about that, that means they love that thing, right? So we have in our, in our uh, communities, it's a crisis of knowledge. And like we said, a crisis of knowledge is always linked to a crisis of love. We need to be people that are uh, um, in-depth, people that have substantive knowledge about this tradition. There's a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ in which he says, towards the end of time, the ummah, the nations, will invite each other to the killing of Muslims like they're inviting each other to a banquet, like they're inviting each other to food. It's interesting the Prophet ﷺ would use this uh, analogy of food, of ta'am, because what do you do with food? You know, you eat food, you devour food. Food doesn't fight back. Food doesn't resist. You can do whatever you want with food. So one of the Sahaba, radiallahu ta'ala anhum, jami'an, uh, he was very concerned when the Prophet sallallahu said this. So he said, مِنْ قِلَّةِ النَّحْنُ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ We must be very few in number at that time. And he said, بَلْ أَنْتُمْ يَوْمَ إِذِنْ كَثِيرٌ 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 You are many, many, many. وَلَكِنَّكُمْ غُثَاءٌ كَغُثَاءِ السَّيْلِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةِ وَالسَّلَامِ But you're going to be like the uh, scum on the ocean. There's a lot of scum on the ocean. And, but it doesn't do anything. It's, it's very shallow. There's no depth to it. There's no substance to it. There's just a lot of it. Right? So we need people that have not just, uh, j not just information about our tradition, but people have in-depth knowledge of this tradition. And quality is always more important than quantity. So there's a great encouragement in our tradition to seek out knowledge. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he said, "We all know the hadith talabul ilm ala faridatun ala kulli Muslim." He said, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, that the acquisition of knowledge uh, or the desire of knowledge is a obligation upon every Muslim. In another hadith, and there's weakness in this hadith, but the ulama quoted for encouragement, for exhortation and edification. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to, to seek knowledge even as far as China. In a hadith related by Abdullah ibn Amr al-As, radiallahu ta'ala anhuma, he says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, one time he passed through the masjid, marra ala that he passed by two gatherings in his masjid. Both of them are good. But then he said, one of them is better than the other. And he describes them. He says, one of them is calling on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They're making dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he said he could forgive them or he could not. 
And then he said, as for the other one, فَيَتَعَلَّمُونَ الْفِقْهَ أَوْ قَالَ عِلْمًا That they are learning fiqh. Fiqh in this context doesn't necessarily mean they're learning jurisprudential issues. Fiqh as used by the salaf means to have a deep understanding of the religion, an essential understanding of the religion. Or he said they're learning ilm, right? وَيُعَلِّمُونَ الْجَاهِلَ And they're teaching the ignorant, they're teaching the ignorant ones. فَهُمْ أَفْضَلْ They are better. ثُمَّ جَلَسَ فِيهِمْ And then the Prophet wasallam he sat amongst them. And learned people know that they have to seek repentance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's another hadith of the Prophet sallallahu And again, this is a weak hadith. It's in a tabarani And we can quote weak hadith as long as not, we're not making a hukum. We're not trying to make some sort of legal ruling from it. You can quote according to the jumhur of the ulama. We can use weak hadith for fada'ilul uh, amal in order to encourage righteous action. So the Prophet sallallahu is reported to have said, that Ramadan is divided into three parts. The first part is mercy, the middle part is forgiveness, and the last part is freedom from the fire. So what do we gain from this hadith is that we have to be in a, in a constant state of istighfar, asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his forgiveness in the blessed month of Ramadan, inshallah ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he teaches us what to say. There's beautiful ad'iyya in the Qur'an, supplications in the Qur'an, there's beautiful prophetic invocations from the Prophet ﷺ. So he's given us all the tools on what to say. One of the most beautiful of istighfar is mentioned in the Quran, Surah Al-Anbiya, ayah number 87, 2187. Make a mental note of that, inshallah, if you don't know this already. This is the dua of Sayyidina Yunus ﷺ. And the Prophet ﷺ, he praised this dua of Yunus ﷺ. He said the first part of it, is tahleel, the middle is tasbih, and the end is a, a recognition of the sin. What did he say? Fanada fit dhulumat, Allah ilaha illa ant. He cried out in the darkness, There is no God but you. Subhanaka, glory be to you. Inni, inni kuntu mina dhalimeen. Indeed, I was of the wrongdoers. Indeed, I was of the wrongdoers. So memorize this dua, inshallah ta'ala, in Surah Al-Anbiya, ayah number 87. It's praised by the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. So the Prophet also said to wear the two sandals of hope and fear. Hope and fear. Khawf wa raja. So we don't have so much hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we become sanctimonious and we start judging other people. And we become self-aggrandizing. And we have personal guarantees. We give ourselves personal guarantees of Jannah. Nobody has a personal guarantee of Jannah. Even if non-Muslims, they claim to have personal guarantees of Jannah, we don't counter that by saying, well, I have a personal guarantee. What did the Prophet Wasallam say? He said, مَنْ قَالَ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ بِصِدْقٍ دَخَلَ الْجَنَّةِ Whoever says, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ with sincerity will enter paradise. But I am I that one? who is going to say it with sincerity, I have no personal guarantee. Insha'Allah, I have hope that when I say, La ilaha illallah, I have sidq when I say that. So we have to be hopeful in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But we don't have so much hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we start acting irresponsibly and saying, well, Allah will forgive me, ghafoor rahim ghafoor rahim This is what people do in the midst of their sin, in the midst of their smoking of their cigarettes or drinking of their alcohol. They're not fasting during Ramadan. And they say, Allahu ghafoor rahim Of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is ghafoor rahim But we haven't looked at the whole picture. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shadeedul iqab. He is severe in retribution. He is al-muntaqim. He is the revenger on the yawm al-qiyamah. He is sari'ul al-hisab. He is the one who is quick to accounting. We forget about that other aspect of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. His overarching aspect, of course, is His mercy. But we have to have, we have to be between hope and fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not too much fear in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that will lead to what? It'll lead to despair. And we will say things like, how can God even forgive me? Look what I've done. Look what I've done. I'm such a wretched person. لا تقنط من رحمة الله. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He says, "Do not despair of the mercy of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Be between hope and fear." In a hadith in Tirmidhi, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is reported to have said, "كل بني آدم خطأون وخير الخطأين التوابون أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام." He said, "All of the children of Adam are sinners. Everybody, they're all sinners." But the best of those who sin 
are those who make tawbah. He said in another hadith in Ibn Majah and At-Tabarani, At-Ta'ibu min al-dham kaman la dhamba lah aw kama qala alayhi salatu wa salam. The one who is repentant of his sin is like the one who did not sin at all. And there's actually a difference of opinion, an ikhtilaf bayn al-ulama, between the muhaddithin. They say, who's actually better? The one who never sinned in the first place or the one who sinned and had the presence of mind to come back and make tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's an amazing that there's actually a difference of opinion as to which one of these two is better. Ultimately, the ulama say the one who never sinned is better because his station is closer to the station of al-anbiya, to the prophets who are incapable of sinning against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But this just shows the maqam the, the station of the one who engages in istighfar. And another hadith that's related by Abu Ayyub al-Ansari, radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says, سَمِعْتُ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَى اللَّهِ عَلَيْهِ وسلم يقول, لَوْ لَا أَنْكُمْ تُذْنِبُونَ لَخَلَقَ اللَّهُ خَلْقًا يُذْنِبُونَ That if you did not sin, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will create a creation that does sin. فَيَسْتَغْفِرُونَ وَيَغْفِرُ لَهُمْ and they will make istighfar. They will repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and He will forgive them. And He will forgive them. The Prophet sallallahu gave a beautiful parable of the maqam of the one who was making istighfar, the one who was at ta'ib, the one who was repenting, reorienting, uh, turning back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We might have mentioned this in previous khutbahs. This is in Sahih Muslim, a beautiful parable. He says, a man, he says, imagine a man is traveling in the desert and his conveyance, his animal bolt, bolts away from him and he sits underneath the shade of a tree. And just as despair is about to overcome him. He sees his conveyance and he grabs its reins and he lifts up his voice towards the heavens and he says, Ya Allah, he says, Ya Allah, anta abdi wa ana rabbuk. He says, Oh Allah, you are my slave and I am your Lord. And the Prophet wasallam said, this man is so overjoyed. He is in such a state of ecstasy. He is, he is, he is so happy that his life has been saved, that he lost control of his speech. He doesn't even know what he's saying anymore. He says, oh Allah, you are my slave, I am your Lord. The Prophet wasallam. he said, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala experiences greater joy when a recalcitrant sinner, when a sinner turns and makes tawbah towards him, than that man at that moment, he's so overjoyed, he lost control of his speech. This is the station of tawbah with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And there's three types of tawbah according to the spiritual masters. The first type is called tawbah, and tawbah is repentance. And all three of these types of repentance, they require contrition and resolve. Nadama, re, nadama means you have remorse for what you have done. Contrition, you're contrite. And you also have a firm resolve never to go to that sin again. Even if you go to it again. At that time of tawbah, you have a firm resolve and you have remorse that you won't return to the sin. When we make tawbah, the ulama say, our tawbah requires a tawbah. Our toba requires a toba. Because we make toba with the tongue, there's nothing in our heart, there's no azima in our hearts, there's no nadama in our hearts, there's nothing in the heart. We just say astaghfirullah on the tongue with fully knowing ourselves that we're going to return to that sin, like we're trying to fool Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have to make true toba to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the first level of tawbah or repentance is called tawbah. And the ulama say here, this means a person who repents to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of fear for his punishment and desire for his reward. That's the station of tawbah. But then there's a higher level of tawbah, which is called inaba. And it's mentioned in the Quran. Inaba means that we repent to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because we have shame before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have shame. The Prophet sallallahu he said, from the ancient message of the first prophets, is either lam tastahi fasna'ma shi'ta that if you don't have shame then do whatever you want and you'll notice in today's postmodern uh, atheist culture we hear this thing all the time do whatever you want do whatever you want as long as you don't hurt anybody do whatever you want no you can't do whatever you want what about the rights of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala what about the rights of the people right Know that we have shame before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the one who is doing inaba is turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, repenting towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of his shame, fear of displeasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is also the difference between khawf and khashia. Right? Khawf. We have khawf of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have khawf of jahannam. Fattaqu nar. The Quran says, be afraid of the fire. What is, what is khawf? Khawf is afraid of bodily harm. Right? A child doesn't disobey his parents because he doesn't want to be beat by his father, right? That's khawf. 
But then there's a higher level called khashiyah, a fear of displeasing one's father. You don't want to disappoint your father. Right? This is the level of inaba. You don't want to displease Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You feel shame. You don't want to disappoint, disappoint him. And then there's the third level, the highest level, which is called awba. And awba means that the person is making tawbah, is repenting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he has not fully submitted, has not fully submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said, لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يكون هواه تبعا لما جئت به أو كما قال عليه الصلاة والسلام None of you truly believe until his hawa. You know hawa, when people want to go on vacation, they go to this place called Hawaii. Right? Hawa, right? his caprice, his desire. None of you is a perfect believer until his desire is in accordance with what I have brought. Is perfectly aligned with the kitab of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Is perfectly aligned with the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam himself, seventy times a day, would ask forgiveness from his Lord. <clears throat> Why is the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, who is ma'asum, he's incapable of consciously disobeying Allah subhanahu wa taala? Why is he in a state of istighfar to Allah subhanahu wa taala? The ulama say because of his inability to praise Allah subhanahu wa taala as Allah praised Himself. This is why he's making istighfar. Sometimes you read in these anti-Muslim, sometimes they're written by these evangelical Christians attacking the Prophet wasallam. because we claim that the Prophet is sinless, he's ma'asum, like all Prophets. And they say, well, if he's sinless, then why does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala order him the Qur'an saying, ask forgiveness for your sin, for your dhumb. So obviously he's a sinner. Because they misunderstand what it means. What is the dhumb of a Prophet? What is the sin of a Prophet? Is leaving an act of great virtue for an act of lesser virtue. The worst thing that the Prophet ﷺ ever did was abasa wa tawalla in ja'ahu al-a'ma. This is the worst thing he ever did. When he was making da'wah to the zu'ama of the Quraysh, a blind man came and sat next to him, Abdullah ibn Maktoum radiallahu anhu, and the Prophet ﷺ did not raise his voice. He never raised his voice. So he's speaking very gently towards this, these mushrikeen of the Quraysh. The blind man came and pulled at his thobe, at his garment. And the Prophet ﷺ turned to him, Abasa wa tawalla. And Abus simply means that he went like this with his forehead. He didn't do it with his face. He simply dropped his eyebrows a little bit. And he's reprimanded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is he doing? He's making da'wah, leaving an act of great virtue for an act of lesser virtue. This is why he's making istighfar. Also for his inability to, to praise Allah as Allah praised himself. On Laylatul Bara'a, according to the hadith, our mother Aisha radiallahu anha said that she heard the Prophet sallallahu in sajda. On Laylatul Bara'a, what did he say? Subhanaka la uhsi thana'an alayk anta kama athnayta ala nafsik. What did he say? Glory be to you. How can I praise you as you have praised yourself? This is why he's making istighfar after the prayer. Astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah. This is his station, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. But we do much worse than that. We need to make sincere tawbah to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and know the station of tawbah. Never ever despair of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In a hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, famous hadith, he says, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, جَعَلَ اللَّهُ الرَّحْمَةَ مِئَةَ جُزْ But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he has divided his mercy into 100 parts. 100 parts. فَأَمْسَكَ عِنْدَهُ تِسْعَةً وَتِسْعِينَ And he has kept for himself 99 of those parts. 99% of his mercy he kept for himself, subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَأَنزَلَ فِي الْأَرْضِ جُزْءًا وَاحِدًا And he sent down 1% to the earth. فَمِنْ ذَلِكَ الْجُزْ يَتَرَاحِمُ الْخَلَائِقِ from that 1%, all of creation shows mutual compassion and love and mercy towards one another. Think about it. How much do you love your child? You will willingly give your life to save your child in this dunya. Willingly give your life. On the Yawm Al-Qiyamah, you will flee from your child. But that's the maqam of the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. In this world, you will willingly give your life. Imagine all the people in the world, all of the animals and the jinn, all over the creation, showing mutual love and respect and, 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 and gentleness towards one another. That's not even 1% of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that He will show 99 parts on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah. This is how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is subhanallah there's many many a hadith of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam demonstrating this through different types of analogy one time after one of the military expeditions there was a woman running around she had lost her son i think i mentioned this before in this masjid as well she lost her very young son barely a toddler 
And this was in front of the Sahaba. She was hysterical and screaming. And then she finally found her son and she picks him up and hugs and kisses and breastfeeds him. And the Prophet sallallahu he said, he said, أَتَرَوْنَ هَذِهِ الْمَرْأَةَ طَارِحَةً وَلَدَهَا فِي النَّارِ Can you imagine this woman throwing her child in a fire? <clears throat> Can you imagine this woman throwing her child in a fire? قُلْنَا لَا وَاللَّهِ They said, by Allah, no, we can't imagine that. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, وَسَلَّمْ أَلَّهُ أَرْحَمُ بِعِبَادِهِ مِنْ هَذِهِ بِوَلَدِهَا أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَاةُ وَسَلَّمْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is more merciful to his servants than this woman is to her. Many, many times. In traditional Muslim world, this was the first hadith that children would learn in kindergarten at five years old. The Prophet said in a hadith where there's five or six mentions of the word Rahma, he said, the most merciful shows mercy to those who show mercy. Show mercy to those on earth and the one in heaven will show you mercy. How many times did I say mercy? Right? This is very interesting that this hadith was chosen by our traditional ulama to be the first hadith to teach our children because it repeats mercy, 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 because we're trying to set the tone of their entire Islamic education. The first thing that children were taught about the Prophet wasallam is that he is rahmatan lil alameen. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls him rahmatan. By, this is called an anartharist noun, an indefinite noun, a noun that is nakira. There's a tanween. And according to Ibn Malik, if you study uh, rhetoric, balagh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses the indefinite article in the Quran with, with nouns or adjectives to describe the Prophet sallallahu this denotes something unbelievable, something you can't even imagine, something totally unique. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not say, وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا أَن تَرْحَمْ الْعَالَمِينَ or something like that. He did not use a verb. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses rahmatan. We did not send you except that you are a mercy. A mercy that is unfathomable, a mercy that is inconceivable. This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about his Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. In the hadith of Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu ta'ala anhu, he says the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, يَجِئُ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ نَاسٌ مِنَ الْمُسْلِمِينَ بِذُنُوبٍ أَمْثَالِ الْجِبَالِ يَغْفِرُهَا اللَّهُ لَهُمْ He says, أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَاةُ وَسَلَامُ That on the يَوْمَ الْقِيَام on the Yawm Al-Qiyamah, the Muslims will see sins like mountains. They're dhunub, sins, transgressions, like mountains. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive them. We should never ever downplay. We should never consider anything insignificant in our lives. There was a woman who used to come into the masjid of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, imra'atun sawda. She was a very old black woman. And she would come and she would clean the mosque of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Just pass by people, no one noticed her, an old woman in the masjid. And she passed away and she was buried. The next day, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam, he's sitting with his companions in the, in the, in a majlis, in his masjid. And he says, where is that woman who cleans my masjid? And they said, she died. And he was very upset sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. He said, you considered her insignificant. But you don't know what she was with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We should never, we should never consider any act of transgression against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be insignificant. Imam Zainul Abideen, one of the descendants of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna Allah khaba thalathan fi thalath. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden three things in three things. Khaba ridahu fi ta'atihi, wa khaba sukhutahu fi ma'asiyatihi, wa khaba wilayatuhu fi khalqihi. He said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has hidden his, uh, his joy and acts of obedience to him. He has hidden his wrath and acts of disobedience to him. And he has hidden his awliya amongst the creation. Remember that woman who was a, a pious practicing woman. She had good outward religiosity, but she was uh, very coarse towards her neighbor. And what did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say? She, he, said that, he said that she is in the nar. Innaha fin nar. She is in the fire. Nasrullah al afiyah wa salama. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for health and well being. Never ever consider any act of disobedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be insignificant. There's many, many ahadith of this. And we'll end with this inshallah ta'ala because we're out of time, but we're coming toward the month of Ramadan and the hadith of Tirmidhi. In the Shema'il at Tirmidhi, he says that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa was the most ajwad nas He was the most uh, generous of human beings. And during the month of Ramadan, he was more generous min al-mursala. 
He was more generous than the uh, rain-laden winds. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Give you one example of this. We'll close with this inshallah ta'ala. There was a man who came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam during the month of Ramadan. He said, Ya Rasulullah, I intentionally broke my fast. I'm not sick. I wasn't a traveler. I intentionally, you know, muta'amidan. I broke my fast intentionally. Ta'i and muta'amidan. I broke my fast. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, you have to fast for 60 consecutive days. This is the kafara. 60 straight days you have to fast. And the man said, I didn't even get to the fifth day. I can't do that. I'm not strong enough to do that. And the Prophet sallallahu what did he say to him? He said, oh, too bad. Big deal. Get, go, do 60 days. What did he say, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Rahmatan lina alameen. What did he say? He said, well, you have to free a slave. You have an option. You can free a slave. And he said, I, I can't afford that. I don't have any, I don't, I don't have any wealth. And then the Prophet sallallahu said, well, you have to feed six, 60 masakeen, 60 poor people. And he said, I, well, I don't have anything. How am I supposed to feed people? So the Prophet sallallahu himself, he goes out and he purchases a huge basket of dates. This hadith in Bukhari Muslim. And he gives it to the man. And he says, here, take this and feed people. And he says, who, who feed who? And he said, masakeen, al-fuqara, the poor people, go feed them. Listen to what he said. The man said, there is nobody more poor in the city of Medina than my own family. There is nobody more poor in Medina than my own family. And the Prophet ﷺ, ibtasama, he smiled and he said, take it and feed your family with it. Take it and feed your own family with it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is what we're talking about when we say, rahmatan lil alameen. <clears throat> we have to be people of mercy. We follow the sharia. Ah. There's no bifurcation of law and spirit. Sometimes Muslims, they inherit the sort of Christian worldview where the spirit and the law are bifurcated. They're seen as antagonists. No, we follow the sharia. Ah. We are not antinomians. There's no way to trans transcend the sharia ah and come into the knowledge of spirituality and you don't have to pray anymore or fast. No, one of the great Sufi, Sheikh Abdul Qadir al-Jilani, there's a story related about him that he was walking down the street and he saw this vision and the skies opened and a voice said, Ya Sheikh, you have transcended the salah you don't have to pray anymore you've transcended it you've reached the maqam where you don't even have to pray anymore he said Anta mal'oon. you are accursed and it was shaitan trying to play with him he said the prophet ﷺ prayed six times a day salat al-tahajjud is wajib one third of the night is wajib on the prophet ﷺ. he said who am i that i've that i've transcended the prayer so don't downplay do your 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 fard Make sure we implement the sharia, ah, implement the fard, the fara'id, five times a day at certain times. Pray during, fast during the month of Ramadan. This is a struggle. Plan your day around the fara'id, not the other way around. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi al-mustafa wa ala sadatina wa immatina Abi Bakr, Umar, Uthman wa Ali wa radiyallahu ta'ala an ashabi rasulillahi ijma'een yaqulu Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala fi kitabi al-aziz ba'da naqulu a'udhu billahi minash shaytan al-rajim inna allaha wa malaikatahu yusalluna ala nabi ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallimu taslima Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ala ala muhammadin kama sallayta ala ibrahim wa ala ala ibrahim fi al-alameen innaka hamidun majid Allahumma barik ala muhammadin wa ala ala muhammadin kama barakta على إبراهيم ولا على إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد اللهم إنا نسألك بنور وجهك الكريم بحقك عليك حسن الخاتمة عند الممات لنا ولأحبابنا ولجميع المسلمين يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم إنا نسألك علما نافعا ورزقا واسعا وشفاء من كل داء اللهم اهدنا في من هديت وعافنا في من عافيت وتولنا في من توليت وبارك لنا في ما أعطيت وقنا شر ما قضيت ربنا لا تزق قلوبنا بعد إذ هديتنا وهب لنا من لدنك رحمة إنك أنت الوهاب ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة والآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إن كنا من الظالمين يا مقلب القلوب الأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على دينك يا مقلب القلوب الأبصار ثبت قلوبنا على طاعتك وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم الحمد لله رب العالمين إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعذكم لعلكم تذكرون وأقيموا الصلاة